for justice and human dignity. And so we wanted to come together and be unified as one. Is that all right? So I, I noticed that they went and got all the way in the back. So I want some of y'all to come up here in the front. <laughs> and what I love about this song is the unity that it's that it states is that we're all God's children. We're all a part of God's body. I need you and you need me. And the song goes on to say, I won't harm you with words from my mouth. I love you. And I need you to survive. Y'all ready?
And welcome to our prayer of service for Christian unity of our churches here in the Red Clay School District area, West Wilmington and its suburbs. So I'm happy to have with me uh, my fellow pastors, Reverend Pearl Scott Johnson of Simpson United Methodist Church, the Reverend Tim Bostick of Limestone Presbyterian Church, and Father Ken Katona of St. Barnabas Episcopal. And I am Father John Hines, pastor at St. Catherine of Siena. I welcome you to our service of prayer and reflection on our theme, to receive one child in my name. We pray, first of all, to affirm our unity as Christians, according to Jesus' prayer. Father, may they all be one, may they be one in us, that, they may, that the world may believe that you sent me. And secondly, in this time of Dr. Martin Luther King's celebration, to seek out a society that is easier for people to be good. And along this line, we focus our attention on the children in our Red Clay School District, 17,000 children, and in the vocational district, to which we are also part of belong, uh, with almost 2,000. We've invited pastors and congregations and schools from all over the western part of Newcastle County and the city of Wilmington. Our reflection and prayer tonight is focused on the children whom I mentioned and on their educators, asking God's blessing on the crucial work of education. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And now let us pray for Christian unity and for all of our children. Oh God, you love the human race. And from each of us, by your grace, you call us and form us into the full maturity of personhood. If only we do not spurn your call. Tonight, we ask you to guide by your Holy Spirit, the parents and teachers of our youth in the Red Clay School District and the vocational districts of our county, so that they may be shaped by the wisdom of their educators. We ask this through Christ our Lord. And now I invite pastors Tim Bostick and Pearl Scott Johnson to for our readings, and then welcome our preacher, Dr. Ronald Whitaker of the Mother African Union Church. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tim Bostick. I'm the pastor at Limestone Presbyterian Church, and I'm thrilled to be part of this ecumenical uh, prayer service of Christian unity, and it's a pleasure to be here with you um, this evening. I want to go ahead and uh, read to you an essay, or at least part of an essay, written by Martin Buber, uh, who was an Australian Jewish philosopher of the earliest, early 20th century. He served as a professor of social philosophy at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and his writings in many ways were considered landmarks in uh, really existential thought and uh, all those deep things that uh, we think about that philosophy brings to us. But what Buber did was he brought this deep conviction of, of our role in educating our children and really helping them, guiding them, if you will, to uh, achieve a greater fulfillment of their very existence. And so the, the part that I'm going to read today is from his essay titled, The Education of Character. Education worthy of the name is essentially education of character. For the genuine educator does not merely consider individual functions of his students as one intended to teach him only to know or to be capable of certain definite things, but his concern is always the person as a whole. 
both in the actuality in which he lives before you now and in his possibilities of that which he is to become. But in this way, as a whole in reality and potentiality, a man can be conceived either as personality, that is, as this unique spiritual fig- physical form with all the forces dormant in it, or as character. That is, as the link between what this individual is and the sequence of his actions and his attitudes. In other words, the way he lives his life out. Between these modes of conceiving the pupil in his wholeness, there is a fundamental difference. Personality is something which in its growth remains essentially outside the influence of the educator. But to assist in the molding of character is in fact his greatest task. One may cultivate and enhance personality, but in education, one can and must aim at character. And that opening line, that, that notion, that education worthy of the name is the education of character. It's this profound thought in which, which our students um, actually can fulfill the very nature of who God made them to be. In fact, Buber even makes comments about that in his essay, that, that in fulfilling this character, we actually make an opportunity for um, this child to then be the child of God. It's exactly what we are taught. He goes on to say in the educator's task that that it doesn't just only consist, but that the real goal once is to recognize it and remember it so that the very work that this educator has done will influence this child's work all the rest of his life. It's that type of character, the impact long term on their lives. And so today, as we we look at Um, how best to begin that journey and that conversation around education and the role education plays. We remember the very nature of God's love. For God so loved the world, uh, not only did he send his son to be with us, but that he calls children everywhere to come near. And it's that kind of notion that we give thanks and praise for the goodness of God. Praise God be to God. Good to be with you all today.
I'm Reverend Pearl Johnson from Simpson United Methodist Church in Wilmington, Delaware. I will be reading to you from Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 1 through 7 and verse 10. I'll be reading from the NRSV. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child whom he put among them and said, Truly, I tell you, Unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of stumbling blocks. Occasions for stumbling are bound to come, but woe to the one by whom the stumbling block comes. And then verse 10, take care that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I tell you, in heaven, their angels continually seek the face of my father in heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God same gospel according to Matthew in Spanish. En aquel momento los discípulos se acercaron a Jesús y le preguntaron, ¿Quién es el más grande en el reino de los cielos? Jesús llamó a Inito, lo colocó en medio de los discípulos y declaró, En verdad les digo, si no cambian y no llegan a ser como niños, nunca entrarán en el reino de los cielos. El que se haga pequeño como este niño, él será el más grande en el reino de los cielos. Y el que recibe en mi nombre a un niño como este, a mí me recibe. Al que haga caer a uno de estos pequeños que creen en mí, mejor le sería que le amarán el cuello un gran piedra de moler y que le hundieron en lo más profundo del, del mar. Hay del mundo a causa de los escándalos. Tiene que haber escándalos, pero ahí es de él que causa el escándalo. Cuídense, no desprecien a niños. Ninguno de estos pequeños. Pues yo se lo digo, sus ángeles en el cielo contemplan sin cesar la cara de mi Padre del Cielo. 
Palabra del Señor. Bountiful blessings, co-laborers. What a blessing and honor uh, to be here with you on this auspicious occasion. Uh, first and foremost, as I always do, giving all glory and honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the head of my life, uh, to the leaders of today's uh, very important unity service, Father John Hines, Reverend Pearl Scott Johnson, Reverend Tim Bostic, Reverend Ken Katana. I celebrate you and I honor you. And I'm just so thankful, amen, just for your kingdom service. For everyone else who played a pivotal role in today's Christian unity service, thank you for your commitment uh, to kingdom excellence. Also to the Red Clay School Districts, I honor all of our teachers and educational leaders, administrators, the board. Thank you for your work that you continue to do uh, for our students and also for the community. And obviously I want to uh, celebrate all of the children and the parents of the Red Clay School District. Uh, there is a sermonic charge that I want to give to you on this evening. And I will be reading from the book of Matthew. Amen, the book of Matthew. Uh, chapter 19, a uh, reading verses 13 and 14. Amen. Again, that is the book of Matthew, chapter 19, reading verses 13 and 14. The Bible says these words, then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and to pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Verse 14 says these words, Jesus said, let the children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. When he placed his hands on them, he went on from them. Amen. If I can just give us a sermonic charge on this evening, I wanna for the next few minutes, just talk from the subject matter no more hindering. No more hindering is what I want to give us a charge with. There is a recent report that was shared over the last few days. And that report found that many of our children are struggling in this season of COVID. Specifically, the new research shows that kids experience both mental and physical health problems, anxiety, depression, lower physical activity, food insecurity, and school disengagement linked to school closures and social lockdowns. We know that this ongoing season where we're dealing with COVID-19, it seems like each and every day, uh, it changes in terms of new guidelines and new recommendations. But not only that, we know that many of our young people are struggling because for close to two years, their life, their world has been turned upside down. And this is where we find the importance of today's text. Because what I want to suggest is that in spite of everything that is going on, when we depict kingdom excellence. And when we show the love of Jesus, some of these natural challenges that many of our children are dealing with, it can be reduced. The Bible says these words in verse 13, then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and to pray for them. Point number one is this, we have to bring our children to Jesus. We have to bring our children to Jesus. As mentioned, many of our children, they are dealing with mental and physical health problems, anxiety, depression, lower physical activity, food insecurity. That symbolizes that we have to bring our children to Jesus. I'm arguing that we have to bring our children to Jesus because I still believe that Jesus saves. Not only do I still believe that Jesus saves, I still believe that Jesus transforms lives. Not only do I believe that Jesus still transforms lives, I still believe that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. I still believe that Jesus gives us joy. I still believe that whatever problem that we may have, Jesus can solve it. Our children need Jesus in these days. But the Bible in verse 13 
doesn't just say that the people brought the children to Jesus and it stayed there. I love what the text says next. And the Bible says these words, Jesus placed his hands on them and he prayed for them. Does anybody still believe that prayer still works? I, I'm so happy that the Bible declares in John chapter 17 that Jesus prayed for all of the believers. Whatever our children may be going through in this season, whether it is depression, whether it is food insecurity, whether it is the stress of life, the stress of how do I now uh, continue to live this thing called life when I'm unsure about what tomorrow may bring? How do I continue to still have uh, optimism towards the future when so many of our elders, so many of our teachers, so many of our leaders are burnt out? What I'm suggesting is that prayer still works. In this season, we have to pray for our children. We have to intercede on their behalf, and we got to bring them to Jesus. But before I get to point number two, what I want to suggest is that oftentimes uh, the way that our children will see Jesus is by the way that we interact with them. <laughs> Some of the old folk may say it like this. Amen. That for many people, the only Jesus that they're going to see is you and I. All that to say is that when we show up day in and day out, whether you are a teacher, whether you are an educational leader, whether you are an administrator, whether you are a faith leader or a youth leader, we got to show the love of Jesus. It's not so much what we say. It's not so much what we tell them where they need to go. It's how we interact with them. Do they, amen, discern that we have love for them? Do they see us giving them our best? Do they see us interceding for someone else? Do they see us, amen, trying trying to meet their needs? Do they see compassion within us? What about grace and mercy? Is that what we are giving to them? We have to make sure that if we're going to bring them to Jesus, if we're going to say, go to church, they first need to see the Jesus in you and I. Point number two is this, because verse 13 is very deep. I, I also uh, I, I suggested already, I should say that, amen, the people brought little children for Jesus for him to place his hands and to pray for them. I already said that, but then the Bible said these words also in verse 13, but the disciples rebuked them. The people realized that the children needed Jesus. The people realized that the children needed Jesus to place his hands on them. The people realized that uh, the children needed Jesus to pray for them, but there were some folk out there that rebuked them. Point number two is this, we have to be on guard. We have to be on guard. We have to stand in the gap for those individuals that don't value the dignity of our children. Can I suggest not everyone in our community has a heart for our children? Can I suggest that not everyone in our churches has a heart for our children? Can I suggest that not everyone in our schools, in our school districts, has a heart for our children? Can I suggest that there are still macro level problems, systemic inequities that seek to disenfranchise our students and their communities. So therefore, we have to stand on gap, stand in the gap for our children because there are some people just like the disciples that want to rebuke. They want to rebuke individuals that would suggest that our children deserve the best. The best that I'm talking about is Jesus in the way that I already said that people are going to see Jesus is by the way that we serve them. We have to stand in the gap and we have to be on guard because there are some folk that do not value the dignity and the humanity of our children. First Peter, verse five and eight says these words. Peter gave a firm warning about this line. The Bible says this, be sober-minded, be watchful. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. We have to pray 
for our children. We have to intercede for our children. We have to spend time with our children. So many of our children are being sucked in to the ways of this world. On social media, they are being bullied. When they go into the community, they are in fear for their life. So therefore, we have to be on guard. I want to conclude with my final point. And my final point is this. They deserve our best. They deserve our best. On this day that we want to uplift the life and legacy of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., let us not forget that Dr. King said these words towards the end of his life about children. He said this, I said to my children, I'm going to work and do everything that I can do to see that you get a good education. But I don't ever want you to forget that there are millions of God's children who will not and cannot get a good education. And then I don't, I don't want you feeling that you are better than they are, for you will never be what you ought to be until they are what they ought to be. Dr. King said these words towards the end of his life. Dr. King was saying, it's just not good enough for my children, my own children, my biological children to get a good education. Amen. It's not just good enough for my family's children to get a good education. What he's suggesting is that every child on planet Earth deserves a good education. Every child on planet Earth deserves, amen, our best, you know, they deserve the best schools, the best resources. So we need to understand that our children, they deserve our best. Jesus said, let the children come to be and do not hinder them for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. I want to close by saying the children deserve our best. When they go into our schools, they deserve the best teachers. When they go into our schools, they deserve the best resources. When they go into our schools, they deserve a curriculum that's going to challenge them for the 21st century global marketplace. They deserve our best. Jesus said, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Jesus said these words, the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Jesus is saying, I want these children to experience excellence. Uh, they Not mediocrity, but excellence. Our children deserve excellent. Uh, but Jesus also said these words, amen. He's going to place his hands on them. Jesus said, amen. I'm going to place my hands on these children. Why? Because I want to anoint them. I want to anoint them because they have a gift inside of them. They have some things inside of them that are supposed to transform this world. But the only way that that's going to happen is that they deserve our best. So colleagues, as I conclude my sermonic charge to you, I want you to understand that there should be no more hindering. Our children deserve quality education. Our children deserve agape love. Our children deserve, amen, resources that will prepare them for the new marketplace. But not only that, we have to bring our children to Jesus, knowing that when we bring our children to Jesus, we are symbolizing, amen, that we're going to give you the best healer. We're going to give you the Prince of Peace. But not only that, we have to be on guard because there are some people in our community, there are some folk in our schools, there are some folk even in some of our churches that do not value the dignity and humanity of our children. So we have to be on guard. And I want to, amen, remind you you are my last point, that they deserve our best. Let's show up day in and day out with the mindset that our children deserve our best. They deserve holistic resources. They deserve, amen, for us to show in, day, show up day in and day out declaring that there is a call on their life, that God has a plan and a purpose for them. Amen. So let us take heed to these words as we remember the life and legacy of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I look forward to continued conversations and dialogues around ways that we can support our children. Thank you so much. Let me pray. Father, right now in the name of our son, Jesus Christ, we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for who you are. We thank you 
amen, for every child that is a part of the Red Clay School District. We thank you, amen, for the call that you have on their life. We thank you, amen, for the gifts and talents that dwell within them. So therefore, Father God, no more hindering, amen, no more hindering. In spite of all of the challenges that we have, let us have the mindset that we're going to show up to do our best. Let us have the mindset that, amen, that we have to bring our children to Jesus, but we also have to be on guard, but we also have to understand that they deserve our best. Amen. May God continue to bless you. I wish you much success, not only today, but as we continue in this freedom struggle. Let the church say amen. testimony from witnesses, teachers, students, grandparents, and human service professionals about this matter of children's reading. Hi, my name is Jacqueline Skipsky, and I teach at Baltz Elementary. I've been teaching for 11 years, students from pre-K all the way to fifth grade. Hello, buenas noches. My name is Yvonne Whiteside, and I'm also a teacher at Baltz Elementary School. I have been teaching here for 17 years, 
and I have also worked with students from kindergarten to fifth grade. Tonight we're going to be speaking about the importance of reading and how you can help your children at home. How many times did you need to read something today? Reading is a part of daily life. You have to read ingredients, mail, text messages, emails, labels, and on medications, signs around your community. When children are at school, reading is in all academic areas. Writing, science, social studies, math. Reading also helps children's imagination, concentration, and build their vocabulary. In the teaching world, kindergarten through second grade, we are teaching students to read. In third grade and beyond, they are reading to learn. So they are reading something and trying to understand what they're reading. We have children of our own. We're gonna talk about some ways that you can help your children at home. Try to read as much as you can. Ask questions about the pictures. What do you see? What is happening? Where are the characters? Also, allow them to read cereal boxes and other texts that you might find around the house. Have them find letters on street signs. And here are two websites that may help you at home. They're both free. One is starfall.com. And another is to just go on YouTube and look for Jack Hartman. He has a lot of different videos about letter names and sounds. We do encourage you to visit your public library. They do have some special services there as well. And you can take out books. And we encourage the students or all your children to read on their own for 15 minutes throughout the week. If you do speak another language, other than English, you can still help. Read in your native language. Talk about pictures, ask questions about who, what, and where. And those are just some suggestions we have for you today. I hope you enjoy and happy reading. Good evening, buenas noches. My name is Miriam Sigler and I'm a retiree of the Parents' as Teachers program which is a collaboration with the Delaware Department of Education, the Division of Public Health and Christiana Care that prepares children for school and helps parents become their children's first and best teachers. For over 17 years, I went into households throughout the Red Clay, Christina, Brandywine, and Colonial School Districts and I read to children. I read to children as young as four months old. I put them on my lap, I opened up a board book, and I held their hands and pointed to pictures so that they could associate the sounds I was making with the pictures. I also showed parents that you don't have to invest a tremendous amount of money in developing a love for reading, both for yourself as well as for your child. If you read to your child at least an hour a day, not only are you showing your child that you're interested in them and that you're engaged in what they're doing, but you're also showing them that this is something that's important and it's, and it's fun. Reading promotes self-confidence. It helps your social skills because your vocabulary is expanded through reading and the greater your vocabulary, the better you can express yourself. Reading is entertaining, it stimulates curiosity, and it de-stresses. A May 2021 Pew study cites that adults who earn $30,000 or less are less likely to be readers than adults who earn $75,000 or more. I don't know about that middle range and everything I just said statistically will not come as a shock to you, 
But in addition to all the intangibles that I mentioned about reading, there's the obvious benefit that the better a child can read, the more likely they are to have the education they need to sustain themselves economically. The, the gentleman, Elon Musk, who started the Tesla company, um, apparently when he was a kid, he read like 10 books a week. Um, don't much, know too many details about that. Maybe they were short books, but the point is, is that uh, it was something that he did frequently. And um, as you know, what we read is different than the vocabulary we hear. Uh, so when children read, they double their vocabulary. Uh, and there is a theory that as we get older, if we read 30 or more pages a day, we might be able to decrease our mental decline by 32%. So reading is food for the brain. And the sooner you read to your child, the sooner they discover this. I would like to close by just quoting the famous abolitionist Frederick Douglass, who said, once you learn to read, you will be forever free. Thank you for inviting me to share this discussion with you. I hope you all have a great rest of your reading life. Prayers of the people. We pray that surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, the church in every corner of the world may be moved by the Holy Spirit to proclaim Christ's unfailing love, that those who are new in their faith might be filled with hope, and that the people of God might never bear silent witness to pain and destruction in the world. We pray especially for educators in the state of Delaware and school superintendents, especially Dorel Green, superintendent of the Red Clay Consolidated School District, that they may boldly and with perseverance serve your children. If these fall silent, let even the stones cry out. We pray for our young nation, that as we come to know ourselves, we may raise up faithful leaders, empower the powerless, shelter the abused, admit our failings, and show kindness to the world. We pray that all those in public and sacred authority might be delivered from selfishness, greed, and indifference. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. We pray for the whole created order, that with reverence and wisdom, we might use its bountiful resources faithfully and have the humility to live within the limits of our gifts, that all will have enough, that none will be burdened by lack or excess, and that we might bring an end to the abyss between the rich and the poor. In returning and rest we shall be saved, in quietness and confidence shall be our strength. We pray for those whom we share our lives, our families, friends, co-workers, and neighbors, for those from whom we are separated, and for the faith communities of those gathered today, that we might have the courage to interpret the present time, to listen to prophets, and to hear God's call upon our own lives, and that our faith, our works, and our prayers might strengthen the lives of all citizens in our school districts, that they might understand student needs and be willing to help. We will continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, in the breaking of the bread and in the prayers. We pray for endurance and resilience in this time of pandemic. We especially pray for the red clay and vocational school districts, for those who suffer illness, isolation, and loss, 
and those who risk their lives for the care and protection of others, especially children. That in the midst of the things we cannot understand, we might believe and trust in the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of life everlasting. We will find rest for our souls, for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. We pray for all those whose bodies have turned against them, whose minds defy them, and whose souls are drained. For those in prisons of the world's making, and for those in prisons of their own making. For those whose hurt causes them to hurt others. For those who devote their lives to thankless causes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We pray for those we have loved and lost and for all those who have gone before us to share with Christ in the heavenly kingdom, that we will be reunited with that holy fellowship when Christ returns to bring the world home. Even at the grave we make our song. Alleluia, alleluia. song, Lamb of God, Cordero de Dios. And now we pray for the peace of Christ upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and grant us the peace and the unity of your kingdom, where you live and reign forever and ever. Amen. I invite all of you to come once again to the forums that we will present to follow up on our prayer service. The forums will be on Thursdays, February 17th, March 3rd, and March 31st. And all will be concerned upon the problem, the possibilities, and the practical approach to the uh, helping children at risk with their reading. And now may Almighty God bless us all, the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and remain with us forever. Amen. Wonderful to be with you. God bless you.
Lord.